Jennings sold his partnership in his alloy factory and found a management job in the New Jersey Shore area. Until we settled in, I had not had time to stop to contemplate the changes all of us were making in our lives. I only knew that I felt safer far away from the demon that was after me. For the first time, too, I began to realize the emotional toll my stalker had taken on me. I was tired, both mentally and physically. The stress of living on the edge emotionally for so long had been wearing on me, and it didn't take me long to see the positive side of my decision to leave my career. I realized that although it was a choice that was forced upon me, in the long run, my being able to spend more of my day with the children was the best medicine for all of us. As much as I missed being in the center of things, I knew my children needed me and deserved to have me as a full-time mother. Before I knew a year had gone by, then another, the children were growing up and they and Jennings had anchored themselves securely in their new environment. Jennings became a deacon in our church, and we as a family attended most of the church functions. It was just about three years into our move to New Jersey that Jennings began to take weekend trips to go hunting during deer season with his brother. He had made so many adjustments in his life because of my circumstances, that although I didn't like being alone on the weekends, I tried to understand his need to touch base with his roots once in a while. And in reality, I still hated hunting and also still felt nervous about wandering about the environment that repressed and represented danger to me. But eventually, the loneliness during his trips away from home began eating away at me. When Jennings came home from his trip, I told him that I had decided to go back to work. I knew he was happier since I had given up my career, but I never predicted the degree he would carry out his anger on my decision to go back to work, especially without consulting him. Jennings just looked at me with a steady glare in his eyes and defiantly walked toward me. He pointed his finger at my face. I warn you. Just make sure your highfalutin job doesn't interfere with the welfare of the children. And he walked out of the room. I had not seen that look since the night years ago, once when I rejected his advances. Isaac Newton must have been doing his research looking through my back door. What goes up must come down. After about a week, on my new job, the phone rang in my office and my secretary informed me I had a call. Hello, Miss Hart. It's been a long time. How are you? Oh, I've missed you. My blood ran cold. I never could forget that voice. It was him. He had found me. Terror gripped my whole being as I stood there speechless, the phone receiver frozen in my hand. The overwhelming enormity of what was happening again burned into my brain and my heart began to pound wildly in my chest. What should I do? I couldn't tell anyone at work. Jennings was still angry with me for taking this job. How could I depend upon him to have any sympathy for me? I regretted being so cocky with him and burning my bridges. The phone rang again. I stared at the phone. It rang once, then silence, then another steady ring, then nothing. The door opened and I jumped. It was my secretary. Miss Hart, I rang you, but you didn't pick up. It's the same man again. He said he had accidentally been cut off and he wanted to talk to you about fire insurance or something. Our house. He knows where I live. I grabbed my coat and 
ran out of the building and got into my car. I'd forgotten about my own welfare and didn't even consider that could have been a bomb wired to it. I was only thinking of my children. I just had to get home to protect my family. Our house in New Jersey was on a three-acre cul-de-sac. Our road only had six houses on it, and there was a slight incline at the road's entrance before it started to gently slope down toward my house. As I entered the short road, our place was not yet visible. I was praying all the way. The nose of my car edged up and then down again as I reached the crescent of the hill. I could see the house. Oh, everything looked absolutely okay. I got closer. I saw the girls playing in the front under the trees with some friends. I turned onto the stone driveway and heard the crunch of the small beach stones beneath the wheels of my car. I was still frightened, but I felt safer now that I was home. The children came running up to me, and I gave them a big hug. Gee, Mommy, not so hard. You're squeezing me to death. Alice and squealed before scampering off to resume playing with their friends. Brett tilted her head as though to demand an immediate response. Why are you home so early? It's a surprise. Get your sister and tell your friends you'll see them later. Sounds fishy to me. What kind of surprise? My ten-year-old prodded. Tell me first. I won't tell. I was losing my patience with her. Now... Get your sister and come into the house. She walked away grumbling how mean I was being, but did get do in what she was told, and we quickly went into the house together to find my husband. Jennings and my son were in the living room watching an old John Wayne Western, and they hadn't heard us come in. He turned away from the screen, and then he heard the girls, Why are you home so early? Get fired? His attitude was less than receptive in seeing me. I would have a hard time telling him my story. I took the children into the kitchen and gave them ice cream and cookies and told them that I had to talk to Daddy about something. Jennings was still watching television when I returned to the living room. Uh, he called today. Who called today? My stalker. He called me at work. Jennings didn't move from his chair, and I waited, holding my breath for his response. Then it came. I don't know whether I can go through this again with you, Sandra. Honestly, I, I, I just don't. The floor could have fallen out from beneath me and swallowed me up, and I wouldn't have cared. The physical threats my stalker could impose upon me could be no worse than the emotional torture I was going through, fearing my husband's abandonment. Once again, I was standing in front of a mirror, bruised and emotionally broken. My ego was fraying. I didn't want to beg to let him know how weak I'd become. I put my hand to my face to shield my emotions, hold back the tears but they came in spite of my efforts. Jennings must have ridden from his chair. I felt his arms surround my body, and he gently kissed the top of my head. Oh, there now, don't cry. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me for life, kiddo. I'll call Pittsburgh tomorrow and see what we can do. In the meantime, I'll get my rifle out and make sure it's in a safe place away from the children and where I can get to it if I need it. I don't think that guy will come around as long as he knows that you're not alone. My hatred of guns made me wary of having a rifle in the house. Jennings was careful enough not to have it loaded, but in spite of that precaution, I still remembered how many times in my news broadcast I had reported killings that had occurred when the victim's weapon was used against them. That crazed animal knew where I worked and probably where I lived. I was a prisoner of my circumstances again. Jennings once more would have the burden of my problems. I decided to carry on as best I could at work. Although it was a false sense of security, I honestly felt safer there than at home. 
I didn't believe he would harm me in an office filled with people. Plus, when I was at work, the stress of my children's safety was partially removed. The investigator called and he had his men working on reopening the investigation. Of course, that meant bringing my boss into the problem. The next morning, behind closed doors, I relayed my tale of terror to the owner of the company. He seemed sympathetic and told us that there would be no problem with the investigation's plan to tap my office line. Arrangements were made to have the work done the next day. That night, my boss called me at home and said not to come in. He feared for his other employees, he said. They would send me a severance check. I was terminated. Well, I wasn't surprised. Another decision made for me. First, my husband would be assured I'd no longer employed, and that would make him happy. Secondly, the stalker would know right exactly where I was all the time, and that would be convenient for him. All of the men in my life had me right where they wanted me. I was prepared for the worst. My thoughts went back again to Pittsburgh and the fears I had. If he were to strike, I hoped that his only wish was to get me and not my children. If it had to be, let him take only me. As my days of mental imprisonment turned into weeks, I began pacing the rooms in my home like a caged animal. The notes the investigator asked me to write, trying to dredge up any past facts that might prove to be a lead, became a daily burden, as it forced me to constantly be reminded that someone was out there wanting to torture me. Finally, in one of my darkest moments, I threw my notes into the fireplace and lit a match to them. No longer the rock I'd always thought myself to be, I slowly was coming apart. I was snapping at the children in the smallest upset, unmerciful toward my husband. I secretly resented his freedom and my need to be bound to him for my safety. Just to be able to drive to the beach alone or go to the country store nearby for the morning newspaper, small pleasures I took for granted. Now were excursions of fear. Night and day I could not shake the fear of doom I felt inside. My months of being bedridden with rheumatic fever came back to haunt me again. Night after night, and the loneliness of my childhood illness brought me. The stress of all of us and on all of us was enormous. Jennings started complaining about pains in his chest. He would lie in bed, unable to sleep, convinced he was having a heart attack. Our doctor said it was stress. Our circumstances were taking its toll on all of us. He would call me four or five times during the day, and if I didn't answer, he would come home to check to see if everything was okay. He was beginning to be as obsessive as I was. One evening in early November, Jennings was working late. The children were in bed, and I was watching the evening news. I thought I heard sounds outside near the window. Oh, it could be a raccoon, I thought. They had been getting into our garbage for months, and no matter how we tried to secure the lids to the cans, those smart little creatures were able to open them and spill the garbage all along the side of the house. But the noise became louder. It sounded like human steps walking through the leaves in the walkway. The sound was magnified a thousand times by my sudden terror. My hand trembled as I turned off the living room light and carefully peered out the window. I couldn't see anything. Should I call the police? What should I do? My mind was playing tricks on me. The moment I had replayed over and over in my mind had come, and I was still thinking about raccoons or embarrassing myself with a false alarm. I crawled across the floor to the kitchen on my hands and knees in the darkness and groped for the phone on the table. My hand slipped on the slick tile floor and thrust my body forward onto the glass cable top. 
its corner slicing through my upper lip. I felt the pain of instant impact, but I was more concerned with the noise I was making that it would identify my location in the house. It was not until I felt the warm, sanguine fluid in my mouth that I realized I'd been cut. I couldn't remember the number for our local police for months etched clearly in my mind. Now it was lost. I dialed the operator and she put me through. Uh, this is Mrs. Hard. I, I heard a noise outside and I think someone is there. Please, please come and check. I'm alone. I tried to hide my terror as I spoke to the dispatcher. I ignored the blood that was running down my chin and trickling down my neck. I gave them my address and waited. I kept the lights off so that I could move about the house without anyone seeing me. I grabbed the kitchen towel and pressed it against my wound and tried to keep my head up as I moved down the hall to check on the children. I sat on the floor my senses sharpened by my raging adrenaline, listening for the crash of breaking window glass, knobs turning, watching intently for the lights of the squad car to reflect off the wall in the children's room. Within minutes, I saw the bright headlights of the police car. They put a searchlight on the house and moved it about the yard. I got up and carefully peered out the window. I saw two officers get out of the car and split up. One was heading for my front door. The other was going around the back side of the house. Each of them held flashlights, which they were shining around as they walked. I heard the officer in the back call to the other officer, heading quickly for our front door. In a moment, there was a loud knock, at, and I opened the door. I turned on the porch light and saw one of the officers. My lip was pulsing, but it stopped bleeding by the time I opened the door. The officer started to say something when he saw the blood, but I quickly showed him my lip and explained. I was sure at that point that I had humiliated myself with a hyperactive imagination over a bunch of raccoons until he spoke. There's a white male out here that is in distress. He's lying on the ground and needs immediate attention. My partner has radioed for the paramedics. Uh, would you mind coming out here to see if you recognize him? A mixture of fear and self-vindication was running through my veins as I went outside with the officer and walked to a place where a man dressed in a worn leather jacket was lying face up on the ground. I was not prepared for what met my eyes. It was my husband. I spoke through a mouth that was beginning to swell and throb painfully, identifying the man as my husband as I kneeled down beside him. He didn't respond. Maybe he had a stroke, I thought, as I touched his motionless form, cradled by the dry leaves in the pathway. I ran back into the house and grabbed a blanket from the couch and covered him. Just then I heard the ambulance pull into the driveway. I threw a raincoat over my bloodstained shirt, woke the children, and I scooped them into the car, and we all headed for the hospital. As I drove, I prayed that my husband would be okay. Jennings was directly taken to the emergency room of our community hospital where he was monitored. The doctors weren't sure what was wrong with him and wanted to admit him for further tests. They told me they, that I couldn't help him, that it would be better for me to go home and get some sleep. They tended to my cut lip and then released me. I left the hospital not knowing what was going to be next. I honestly didn't know how much more I could take. I felt so sorry for my children who had been drawn into all of this through no accident or action of their own. They were just along for the ride in my life. It was so unfair to, for them to be swept up in a journey that was unpredictable, with no end in sight, a journey whose outcome none of us could control. Driving home that night, I felt as though I'd been set out to sea with my fate at the will of the winds. Whatever direction they were blowing, that's where I would go. If something happened to my husband, 
I hadn't the slightest clue as to what I would do with my life. Jennings had extensive tests done on him during the week he was in the hospital, and at the end of his stay, his attending physician called me in to meet him. He said that the tests indicated his motor reflexes are normal and he had regained the use of his legs. We really have not been able to find anything physically wrong with him. Oh, how can it be? How can he be paralyzed and not have a, had a stroke or something? I don't understand what he was trying to tell me. Then he dropped the bombshell. Well, your husband's mental illness has predisposed him to psychosomatic symptoms that are real to the patient and at the same time can also produce results such as chest pains, mimicking a heart attack, or, in severe cases like Mr. Hart's, psychosomatic paralysis. I, I was totally confused. What do you mean, his mental condition? His schizophrenia. The doctor's words hit me like a brick. Was he talking about the same man that I knew? I couldn't believe it. Oh, there must be some mistake. I'm sorry, you must be mistaken. He started nervously shuffling the papers he had on his desk. Well, I assumed as his wife you knew. His records we sent for from Pennsylvania indicated he was treated for schizophrenia in the past. There was an uncomfortable silence in the room as I was computing this new information that entered into my life. I knew Jennings had been in therapy when, but, but he told me it was to work out issues that involved his earlier life. He has schizophrenia. I heard myself break the silence by putting those words together, hoping I misunderstood him. Yes, and it is important that you understand the seriousness of his illness because he's in a state of acute paranoia and will have to try to get him stabilized with medication before we can release him. The doctor then continued by asking me various questions about Jennings' personality, from my perspective, his habits, if he displayed unusual behavior toward me. The way I looked at it, considering my life so far, I was not the one to judge what was normal and what was not. Too much high drama was going on around me constantly. I would be the last person to be able to qualify normal behavior. At that point, I didn't think I'd ever seen or would be able to recognize normal if I had. I knew Jennings would exaggerate the truth sometimes, but a lot of people did that. Maybe he just wanted to be more than he really was. His white lies made him feel good about himself, and I ignored them. I sat there in the doctor's office that morning feeling a lot of things and asking myself the same questions that I would ask myself over and over again in the ensuing years. How is it possible that I, supposedly an intelligent woman, didn't suspect? Was I so concerned about myself that I didn't see? Who would believe that someone could be married to a man for over 10 years and not know? Why, you know, I didn't realize I said out loud more to myself than the doctor. Well, for one thing, you may be too close to the situation, he said. As a wife, you may have accepted certain behavior that others would find not acceptable. Unfortunately, I understood what he was saying. Hindsight can be a great teacher, and I had the feeling I had old and new lessons to learn in the months to come. I wasn't too sure I was up to it. Jennings finally was released from the hospital and seemed to be calmer and quite eager to resume with work again. In the ensuing weeks, he acted as though nothing had happened, but I had changed. I was having trouble forgetting that never was honest with me from the start about his illness. The more I learned about schizophrenia, the more the pieces of the puzzle started coming together. 
his constant checking on me, the earlier phone calls that were supposed to be concerns for my safety, all now had a deeper meaning. He was only worried that I was out of his control. Little lies and exaggeration that before just annoyed now had a new importance to them. I had little faith in anything that he told me. Perhaps I was taking it to the extreme, but ignorance is not bliss. What I did not know or suspect about my husband's condition was a dangerous and destructive ignorance. In my case, my husband's motives and his actions were being questioned by me. And in a way, I guess some of his paranoia was rubbing off of me. I became suspicious that his actions may always have been a veiled motive. The first doctor that I had seen had been right. He told me that Jennings had the ability to fantasize just about anything and make it seem real, at least to him. He was believable and just might be smart enough to get his way by making people think that I was the one with the problem. Should I, conjunct, should I confront Jennings about his fears and try to ease his paranoia, or should I choose to hide behind my anger and suffer? Would it really matter? Could I reach beyond his insanity and touch some area of reason within him? Or maybe I would be treading into dangerous territory that could trigger his paranoia into a weapon of violence against me. I was torn between reason and a compelling force to confront my husband with his lies. The situation was both frightening and hopeless. There was no doubt he was consumed by a fantasy world unknown to the rest of us. He had scripted the play and given us parts that we had to flesh out. In his mind, there was no other way it could be. If I were to stay with him, it was a role that I would have to play. You're welcome here. Welcome here. Our hearts you hold hostage, that much is clear.